a great pl pleasure and privilege to introduce our process card thandari yeah you cannot find any english teacher without using his books across the world i got the proud privilege to meet and interact with him during iitfl annual international conference held at brighton uk in 2018 Professor Scott is an internationally recognized academic and teacher trainer in the field of English language teaching. Along with Luke Meddings, <coughs> he is credited with developing the dogmatic language teaching approach, which emphasizes meaningful interaction and emergent language over prepared materials following an explicit syllabus. He has written over a dozen books on ELT methodology. Two of these, Natural Grammar and Teaching Unplugged. Have won the British Council's Elton Award for Innovation, the top award in the industry in 2004 and 2010, respectively. He is also the series editor, editor for the Cambridge Handbooks for the Language Teacher, and the author of many academic papers on language teaching. His A to Z ELT blog is one of the most influential and well-visited blogs in the field of ELT. His approximately 15 textbooks for beginning. Uh, beginning and intermediate learners have been published by major academic presses including both oxford university press and cambridge university press above all he is a lovely person great human being and down to earth person i need many hours to talk about him due to time constraint let me stop here i wish all the participants from india and across the world to have a fruit, fruitful learning the select participants are attending via zoom and other participants are watching in the live already i we got a registration of around from 71 countries i think uh, all of them have joined in the youtube live and select selected participants are there in the zoom and it's my great proud and privilege and i thank the whole hotel lee professor scott for having accepted our invitation now it's a uh, session is over to professor scott thank you professor you can start now thank you dr raja sekaran thank you very much can you just confirm that you can hear me Okay, fine. Uh it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Yes, fine, um, fine, fine. Even if remotely, I'm conscious that uh there's a lot of people here on the uh Zoom channel and also watching on YouTube live. Uh it's a great honor to be to talking to you about something which is very dear to my heart, which is uh professional development or continuous professional development. Just to give you to add a little bit to those auto or those biographical details that Dr Raja very kindly supplied I uh I've worked pr primarily as a teacher educator all my professional career in one way or the other when I wasn't actually teaching uh I've worked with um pre-service teachers on celta kind of courses I've worked in in-service uh teacher training on delta courses I work currently on a master's program for university based in the United States which is also directed at practicing teachers uh and I've the books that I've written that Dr Raja kindly mentioned have all emerged out of my experience oh training teachers talking to teachers talking to teachers on training courses talking to teachers at conferences and now of course talking to teachers online which is where we're all having to meet so i do feel that uh the subject of professional development is something as i said it's dear to my heart that i i have been immersed in for essentially up to 40 years of my professional career Uh, and so in the time that i have today and given the huge diversity of assist of participants here from all parts of the world and given the fact that uh, actually i've had no experience directly teacher training in india uh unfortunately, unfortunately um uh i have to make this very general this discussion and i hopefully make it somehow interactive uh so that you uh have a chance at least to ask me questions and and I can find out a little bit about you also and what your particular interests and uh contexts are so i'm going to do this uh first of all i'm going to start by uh sharing my screen uh and i want to uh see if i can Okay. Uh that's my PowerPoint, but before I do that, I want to 
do this with you. Uh, it's a little questionnaire just to find out where you are in terms of your, I mean, okay, the, the talk is called the future of professional development, but I'm going to look at the past, your past specifically. And this is a kind of survey and I hope it works. So what you have to do is uh, go into this website, www.menti.com. Uh, you can see it's along the top there. So either from where you're working on your desktop or on your phone, go into that and you'll, and if you key in the code, Eight two five nine eight four. You should get to this page where you can see this question: Which of the following continuous professional development activities have you experienced? And if you choose from that menu, for example, on the right you see reading webinars like this one, discussion group, classroom observation, and so on. Uh, you can choose as many as you like. And theoretically, uh, the answers should start to appear on the screen. This is the first time I've done this. So, uh, well, it's the second time, actually. I did it the other day in Turkey, but uh, it was organized for me by my hosts. Uh, I'm hoping that um, in a short amount of time, we should start to see uh, some results. So. Uh, I've given you uh, a minute to do this and we can extend it if need be. So as I say, go into, now here we come, here come the results, menti.com and use the code 825984. And here we see that the results are coming in thick and fast and that at the moment there's a preference for webinars and team teaching, interesting, as well as discussion groups, classroom observation. One person, two people have used reflective diaries. Uh, a number of people uh, acknowledge reading as being an important source. Uh, learning a language, and I want to come back to that one uh, shortly because it's something I've done recently. Uh, conferences are now starting. Conferences and webinars are definitely uh, the flavor of the month, as well as short courses. Uh, we're getting more and more I'm not surprised, in fact, uh, the number of people who are clicking on webinars uh, in the last 10 days or, or two weeks. I've never done so many webinars myself, as well as attending webinars. And of course, that's a sign of the times. I'm pleased to see that reading uh, is, uh, is getting a, a number of hits too. So that's quite a good spread of activities. Let's go to uh, the next uh slide if i can which is uh, these are the things that you have done uh now i'm interested in what do you rate highest uh, and you can choose three so of the same menu and using uh, the same code which of these do you rate uh highest and i'll give you again i'll give you a minute to uh answer Oh, this is working like a dream. This is so reading, 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 reading my books, I hope, uh, or books <laughs> that I've edited and webinars. There's a strong preference for both reading and webinars, uh, but it's good to see that classroom observation gets a mention and discussion groups. And again, I want to come back and talk about some of these things specifically. Um, it's very interesting that reading should be so uh, prominent here. Uh, and I'd love to ask you more questions about this, uh, but it's, a, it's an equal, it's a, it's an equal uh, battle here between reading and webinars and probably doing the two things in conjunction. Um, some people have mentioned action research. I'm pleased to see that. And again, learning a language. Yeah, I can't talk enough about the benefits of that. When we look at discussion groups, we look at different ways of forming discussion groups. Of course, they can be online. In fact, they're probably only online now. Um, so that's really, really interesting. And it's, it looks like that reading has come out just in the minute I've given you, it's come out top on that survey, but closely followed by webinars uh, with um, some appreciation of the value of conferences and short courses, and of course, classroom observation. 
Well, that was great. That's given me a sense of uh, where you're at. Uh, now I'm going to close that. Thank you very much. And open my PowerPoint. And then we can begin the presentation. So just to recap, that was the uh, test um, task I set you. Uh, and uh, those, I, I haven't got the results, but here's an extended list of activities. Um, I gave you 11 to choose from, but I've extended it here just to fill the page. Uh, and notice that reading actually coincidentally is at the top of this list and reading was the one that many of you voted as being the most useful. And that includes, of course, reading uh, journal articles and books, but also reading online, reading blogs, et cetera, about teaching. And again, thank you, Dr. Raja Sekaran, for mentioning my blog, An A to Z of ELT, which is in the moment in a kind of dormant stage, but has been uh, very, a very busy site, both for me and for the people who've contributed comments to it. Um, a number of other things there. I'll just move on. I, I don't want to go through this list exhaustively. We can come back to it if we've got time. Uh, but I, I'm just going to identify here the things that I personally found very important in my own professional trajectory. Uh, and I agree with the, uh, many of you that reading uh, articles, particularly in journals, journals for teachers, uh, as well as books, have been very influential in my personal development as a teacher. Um, I mm, wasn't, when I started teaching, I was teaching in Egypt and I didn't have access to a lot of these more technological media like videos. And uh, of course the internet hadn't been invented then. Um, but uh, uh, so reading was really the substitute. Um, I just go down to number seven, though, and formal chat with colleagues was probably the first thing I ever did as a teacher. Uh, and that was um, with the, the, I was lucky enough to work in an institution where we had a teacher's room. Uh, and not only that, where we shared the preparation of lessons, materials, ideas, etc. So there was a lot of informal uh, lesson preparation. And uh, for that, I'm extremely grateful. Uh, those first formative years without any real uh, organized professional development opportunities depended very much on collegiality, talking to my colleagues. Uh, and that was more formalized uh, as we went along into um, uh, to organize teachers meetings, which we ran uh, regularly every week. There would be a seminar either conducted by the director of studies or by volunteer teachers, including myself. And this was an extraordinarily uh, important part of our professional development. So it was all local. It was all done on site. And it was a kind of bottom up initiative in a sense. I mean, it was a it was part of the culture, if you like, of that particular institution and subsequent schools that I worked for in that worldwide organization, organization. provided similar kinds of um, uh, informal professional development opportunities. It wasn't until much later that I was able to do number 10, attend conferences, either locally or internationally. Uh, and of course, that's a luxury that uh, that uh, many of us don't have access to, and certainly we don't have access to it the, in, the, in the present time, not to on-site conferences. Uh, but those were, became very important for me uh, in my subsequent professional development. Uh, and going back up the list, being part of a discussion group online, um, Dr. Raja Sekaran mentioned the fact that I and Luke Meddings and a number of colleagues started uh, what was called Dogma ELT or Teaching Unplugged uh, 20 years ago, in fact. Now, that generated an online discussion group, which was incredibly busy uh, and very productive in terms of um, uh, the kinds of issues and both theoretical and practical that came up in that discussion. Uh, so that for me was for at least 10 years, I worked on that discussion group online and we generated something like, I don't know, tens of thousands of posts with up to a thousand or more 
uh, attendees, although not all of them were regular. But that was a very, very important means of keeping contact. And of course, this is global. We were talking to teachers all around the world, teachers in Brazil, teachers in Thailand, teachers in Korea, teachers in Romania, teachers in Russia. Uh, it, it was the best of what's, what you're able to achieve on online discussion groups. Going down that list, uh, down to number uh, 15 at the bottom, of course, uh, all of us, I'm sure, have done at some point some formal study uh, subsequent to our pre-service training, either uh, some kind of diploma or a master's course or a PhD. And these periods uh, of formal study, of course, are very important. They're very disruptive uh, and they're very expensive, but uh, they are uh, they are extremely useful. And I think if you can fit them into your trajectory, career trajectory, they are um, they are major milestones. And of course, they have the benefits too of giving you qualifications, which may make you more employable. But you do learn a lot. And I think, but again, a lot of what you learn on these courses tends to be uh, incidental. It's, it's peripheral to the course itself. It's what you t discuss with your other your fellow students uh, at, you know, after the, the lectures have finished, et cetera. It's the contact you maintain with your fellow students after the courses have finished, uh, as, it is, as it is with conferences too, to a large extent. And then finally, I just want to talk about number 12, which is um, going back to the classroom to learn a language. And I think this is such a, a wonderful thing if you've got an opportunity to, to, to do this. If you work in an institution where other languages are taught and if you can, if you can manage to fit it in, then if, it's, it's a great uh, opportunity to experience what it's like to be a student again. But of course, you don't have to do this on, on site. You can do this online uh, and, you, and there's all sorts of apps and websites, etc., which allow you to experience at least part of what it is like to be a language student again. Uh, and I did this recently, two or three years ago. I live in Spain. Uh, my Spanish is, rudim well, I mean, it's about B2 level, but it's certainly, it's stabilized, if not fossilized. And so I went back to the classroom uh, two or three years ago to do an intensive course in Spanish. Uh, and it was extraordinarily uh, productive, both well, in terms of my Spanish, marginally so, uh, but it was very productive in terms of uh, putting me back in the in the in the passenger seat, as it were, uh, and making me think yet again about uh, the value of classroom teaching, uh, and also the value of certain kinds of activities that we did in the classroom. Uh, and I've written and talked about that also on my blogs. So those are some of the things that personally have impacted upon my professional development. I've done other things uh, as well, of course, peer observation, team teaching, keeping reflective diary. I've done perhaps less of those things uh, and, and less regularly than the other things that I've marked here in red. Um, and I think just to sum up the stage of the talk, these are the kinds of activities that uh, in a sense, make us, cause us to rethink some of the kind of things that we take for granted in teaching. And it's very easy to fall into a bit of a, a rut uh, or to keep perpetuating the kinds of teaching that you were trained when you were first trained before you ever started teaching or to perpetuate the kind of teaching that you experienced when you were a language learner or a learner at school. Um, because, of course, those the ghosts of the teachers that we had in our primary and secondary schools do tend to persist and influence us one way or the other. Uh, and I think this is where I'd like to make a distinction between people who have lots of experience, who are expert, uh, and people who have lots of experience but are not expert, that is to say, even though they have experience, many years of teaching, you wouldn't actually classify them as being expert teachers. This is a distinction made by Amy Sui in a book that came out uh, a few years ago where she makes a distinction between uh, what she calls, as I say, expert teachers and experienced non-expert. So the experienced non-expert is the teacher more or less who's been doing the same thing year in, year out uh, for a very long time. And the difference 
is not that the experts do things better than the non-experts. It's not that they, the experts do things well and the non-experts do things badly. But the distinction that she makes is that the experts problematize what seem to be routine practices and address them, whereas experienced non-experts simply carry out practiced routines. The key word there for me is problematize. They ask questions about their practice. They don't take it for granted. Uh, and I think this is, the, this is key. And this, 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 to me, resonates because in my own experience, uh, those critical moments when I suddenly thought, wow, hang on, this is not what I expected to happen. This is not what I told would happen. This is not what I was trained to believe should happen. When an incident, something happens in the class that makes you rethink or somebody or a colleague says something or you watch a colleague do something in their class and you think, wait, hang on. And this forces you out of your routine. And it forces you, it challenges your accepted uh, orthodoxies, if you like. And uh, the kinds of questions that it forces you to ask uh, can be organized like this. And this is a useful rubric for if you're a teacher educator yourself uh, at the beginning of a teacher training program to ask your trainee teachers these four questions. What is it that I do? What's the meaning behind it? What does it mean that I do this? How did I come to be like this? And finally, very importantly, how might I do things? How might I do things? Not how should I do things differently, but how might I do things differently? When I think about this, like for example, um, now, doing what I'm doing now, how do I do webinars, for example? How do I do this? Now, at the moment, I'm kind of lecturing you, but I do try to integrate some inter interaction as in as much as the technology allows me to. I'm trying to find that as I speak, I'm trying to find the chat, uh, the chat window here to see if anybody's actually, and I'm not seeing it. And that's a problem of Zoom, um, I think. Anyway, whatever. Um, <laughs> but, but that's what I do. I try to interact because the meaning behind this is quit number two. What is the meaning behind my teaching of lecturing but interacting? Is because I do believe that language, uh, that learning is co constructed, and that you can do this in a dialogic way, ideally through question and answers or through uh, statements and responses, for example. And I came to be this way because of my experience as a language teacher, and partly because I was trained to ask questions and to elicit and to listen to answers because it was more involving. But how could I do things differently? And I'm thinking about this constantly as I do more and more webinars is how can I do webinars differently so that they were even more interactive and maybe take away the PowerPoint completely and just turn it into a conversation. It's typical, I think, of webinars that, you, that the speaker does a presentation and then there's 10, 15 minutes at the end for question and answers. Uh, but sometimes I wonder if maybe it'd be more important to have the question and answers first and see what the the participants want to ask and then move on if there's time to the presentation. In other words, kind of flip, flip the order of the talk. Uh, we're not doing that today, but I did try to start with something that was motivating, which was the, um, the, uh, uh, the survey to at least find out where it was you're coming from. So this kind of these kinds of questions, the questions that we as trainers should be asking our trainees, but we as teachers should be also asking ourselves, what is it I actually do? And one way of finding out what you do, which is very revealing of this course of, of recording yourself or either audio or video. Nobody likes to do that. But my experience as a trainer, when I've recorded my trainees on, for example, diploma courses, and then we look at the recording together and discuss it is always very re revealing. And if, 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 if it's done sensitively, uh, it can be an extremely uh, valuable process. And of course, it's easy to do this nowadays with phones rather than setting up complicated tripods and boom mics and whatever, but you can actually record a lesson 
relatively successfully just using a phone or a bit of a lesson, transcribing that bit of the lesson, looking at the kind of questions you ask, for example, do I ask real questions like what did you do at the weekend or do I ask um, display questions like have I got a nose on my face kind of thing. These are the sorts of questions, the sort of research that's done into teachers' questions has been very revealing to show that most questions that teachers ask in whatever subject are display questions. They're the questions that the teacher asks so that the students can display their knowledge, but they're not exactly, they don't get to the kind of uh, identity issues and the uh, emotional issues that real questions get to. Uh, for example, what kind of music do you like, or what's your favorite uh, vegetable? You know, they're not threatening questions, but they are. They go a little bit further than "Have I got a nose on my face?" or "How many fingers have I got?" So these kinds of things, describing what you do, and then trying to unpick it. What is it? What is it? What's the meaning behind that? Where does that come from? Uh, question number three, was it my training? Was it something I read, which is something I just do instinctively without thinking? Is it a habit? Is it something my teachers at school used to do? Um, and then uh, how could I do it differently? How could I do it differently? What could I do? And what would the effect of that be? And so really what we're talking about is the, so the famous reflective cycle where you, you have experiences going to the top of the cycle, you reflect upon it, you theorize, you draw some kind of conclusions from that, and you may go to the literature on teaching or colleagues or whatever to inform your theorizing. And then you plan a new, you know, how could I do this differently then? Uh, and plan an experiment, experience it, reflect, conceptualize, experiment, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this is the ideal kind of learning cycle that any kind of in-service training or continuous professional development should really be structured around. And there's all sorts of ways of doing this, all sorts of ways. You know, one way, of course, is to keep a reflective diary. Uh, and I did this as a trainer. I, I used to do this when I was teaching on pre-service courses, the, the CELTA course, uh, which was to have the trainees keep a diary describing their lessons and not just their lessons but also the input sessions the methodology sessions uh, incorporating those into their diaries reflecting on their lessons drawing conclusions from their reflections so for example a typical reflection may be the students were confused obviously they didn't know what to do uh, so the uh, conceptualization may be it's very important to make your uh, instructions clear, but not just clear, but intelligible because we're dealing with second language learners here. So you can't use low frequency vocabulary, for example, when you're giving instructions uh, and you have to perhaps model what it is that you want the learners to do so they can see what it is they have to do. Uh, as well as hear it. So this is the conceptualization. Okay, so the next lesson, I'm going to try that. And to do that, I'm going to plan, I'm going to write out my instructions, and I'm going to check them with my uh, tutor to make sure that they are, they use language which will be comprehensible to the learners of this level. Then they do the lesson, reflect on it, talk about it, etc. And so we go on and on. And that there's, you know, it's, so that's what they did in their diaries and their, their learning logs. They wrote about these lessons uh, and I was able to share with them the reading of the lessons and draw and share their and, and comment on their diaries and um, add if necessary and it wasn't that necessary at any of my own observations. Uh, and again, here's another way of visualizing that the way that particularly the theorizing part works that uh, you have the practice which interacts with the reflection. You're doing stuff and thinking about it and doing more and thinking about it. And you're drawing on two kinds of theories. The theory in your head, as it were, your own practical, uh, practical personal theory, it's been called, of teaching which is informed by all sorts of things, including your own experience as a learner, but also your own values and beliefs. Uh, and this is very important and not to be underestimated. If you believe sincerely that learners have the capacity to direct their own learning, 
then that will inform your teaching and your reflection. If you don't believe that learners have that capacity, then you won't integrate learner generated activities into your classrooms. Uh, you're less likely to. And then, of course, there's theory as a body of external knowledge. And that's why we read. That's why we go to webinars. That's why we go to conferences, because we want to kind of check in to see what it is that the research tells us, what other uh, teachers say about teaching, have written about it, and so on. So it's a combination of those two kinds of theory, internal theory and external theory. Internal knowledge drawn from experience, values, beliefs, etc. And then that body. And if, uh, if you only work on the theory in your head, there's a danger that you might be going up a one-way street. That's why it is, as I say, very important to work to be in touch with theory as a body of external knowledge. And one way we can do this in the classroom, uh, again, here's another kind of rubric, my reflection chart. So this is like keeping a diary, but not as not as elaborate where you just have after a lesson the name of the activity so the warmer the presentation the role play etc what i did what i learned what i learned and it's very imp important to emphasize the the uh the positive here uh okay remaining difficulties there's nothing's perfect uh and if, and feelings about the activity in general and this provides a useful record for yourself, but also uh, for your trainer or for your colleagues, if it's something that you would like to share. Uh, so there's lots of different rubrics, lots of different ways of uh, activating the reflective cycle. And why should we do this? Because it keeps us professionally alive. It keeps us from becoming that kind of experienced non-expert teacher who just coasts along from day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year, doing the same lessons, perfectly happy, fine, okay, have no problem with that. But some people are perhaps more frustrated and more uh, aspirational in terms of what they want to achieve in their teaching. And these are the expert teachers who, as I say, problematize they problematize what they're doing they think about it, they question it uh, and then they experiment uh, with what they're doing and they do this with colleagues they do this on their own they do this informed with reading webinars conferences etc so it keeps you professionally alive because otherwise you just become a cog in the machine uh, and i want to move on now uh, and looking <laughs> Uh, at, at that notion of the cog in the machine. And this is, I think, is, is a symptom of, in many professions that it's hard, it can be hard, this writer says, not to feel that one is just a cog in a machine, you know, just a part of it, something else, then you have no agency, uh, you have no control. Uh, and so not surprisingly, in this work that this writer is talking about, one begins to wonder, how do I really matter? Now, the writer who said this is not, in fact, a teacher. He is this man. Um, I'd love to know if anybody recognizes him, but I can't. Uh, let's see. I just can't seem to access this chat. Never mind. Um, do you recognize him, I wonder? He's a doctor, he's a surgeon. Uh, and he works in the United States, and he's written a number of books about medicine. And it's very interesting. It comes from a completely different field, but what he says here, I think, reflects how a lot of teachers feel, that it can be hard if you're working in an institution, and particularly now if you're working in an institution, but you're working off-site because you're working online, that you just feel that you have no agency. You're just a cog in this machine. Uh, and you begin to wonder, how do I really matter? So this is the man, uh, Atul G Gawanda, uh, forgive my pronunciation, uh, and he wrote a book in 2008 called Better, A Surgeon's Notes on Performance. Uh, his most recent book is appropriately called Being Mortal. Uh, I haven't read it, but I it seems to be extremely topical because it's all about how uh, how to care for people in the last stages of their lives. 
Atulga Wanda is a wonderful writer. And if you haven't heard of him and you, and you want to read outside our own field of uh, language teaching, read this book. I read it by complete chance. Somebody, I was staying with a friend uh, that it was uh, in the guest, I was in the guest room. It was on the bedside table in the guest room. I picked it up. I had jet lag at the time. I couldn't sleep. I picked it up. I started reading it and I couldn't stop. And this is the blurb on the back of the book. The blurb on the back of the book says the struggle to perform well is universal, but nowhere is the drive to do better, the drive to do better, remember the name of the book is called Better, more important than in medicine. Atul Gawanda uh, explores how doctors strive to close the gap between best intentions and best performance in the face of obstacles that sometimes seem insurmountable. And of course, you, this resonates very much at at the present moment. But he says, uh, he says, nowhere in, is the drive to do better more important than in medicine. And of course, that's true, because it's a life and death issue. But I would also say that actually, the drive to do better is also very important in education. I mean, in any profession, clearly, but in education, more than most, because so much is at stake, so much is at stake, particularly the education of young of young uh, learners, but universe, whatever. I mean, it's obviously critical. Education opens so many doors for people. So the drive to do better is very important. And so Artur Gawanda talks about what it is. One of the things that he's famous for, incidentally, uh, is in the hospital that he worked at in Pennsylvania, I think. They couldn't work out why there was so much infection within the hospital, generated within the hospital. And although people knew that they should wash their hands, surgeons, before or after operations, in fact, when it was discovered that they weren't really doing this properly. So Gawanda, they instituted a proper hand uh, washing routine. And of course, the results were spectacular in terms of the way it cut down hospital infections. So this is a kind of practical applications of the kind of thinking that goes behind uh, problematizing your actual practices. Now, at the end of the book, uh, and this is what I'm getting to, Gawanda uh, has five conclusions, five recommendations. If you want to stop being a cog in the machine, if you want to assert yourself professionally, if you want to move on, and if you want to gain a sense of agency uh, and, uh, profession and professional self-esteem, and so this is what he talks about. These are his five recommendations, and I, I'm going to throw them out, uh, and then we'll t uh, I'll um, give some examples, and hopefully we've got time to discuss them. So the first one, and this is controversial, but he says, don't complain. Don't complain. You know, a situation may be awful. It is awful. Uh, but you're not going to get anywhere by simply complaining. He says, resist it. It's boring. It doesn't solve anything. And it will get you down. You don't have to be sunny about everything. But just be prepared with some, something else to discuss. Just be prepared with something else to discuss. See if you can keep the conversation going. That is to say, think of some, okay, we're in this terrible situation um, globally uh, and educationally and in terms of language teaching. But there's not a lot to be gained about simply complaining about it. We've got to kind of get a conversation going and see if there's any way that we can alleviate this enormously problematic situation that we're in. It's never been so problematic in terms of education, in terms of anything. So for example, there's all sorts of ways that you can get the conversation going. And of course, one of them uh, that you'll be familiar with is through social media and networking. And so this comes from Twitter, uh, you'll recognize. And this is a teacher who's working in Poland, teacher trainer. And she's a regular and frequent uh, tweeter uh, amongst a whole chain of a group of teachers who uh, keep in touch with each other principally through hash, hashtag ELT chat. Uh, and she's uh, been working in, as I say, in Poland, uh, working, having to move everything online. And she generously uh, provides some, uh, a link to uh, some advice she's collated 
from her particular school in Poland about how to move on to Zoom and how to hopefully to find how to access the chat, uh, the chat program when you're giving. I click and I click on it, but it just doesn't. Anyway, uh, when you're giving a presentation. And so there's a link there. And then what's interesting is, of course, is that how people respond. So this is the thread that's created by her initial uh, prompt. So somebody else, uh, you know, and that's brilliant stuff as usual saying, thank you so much. I've used Zoom before, but not much. The breakout rooms are the key feature that makes this much more. So you see, this is people talking to each other. How I used to talk to my colleagues in the teacher's room in International House, Cairo. Here, people are talking to each other in this global teacher's room, which is the, are these Twitter forums. And they are congratulations. There's a lot of effective stuff, a lot of positive stuff. Good luck. Thank you very much. And then people contributing ideas of their own. So this is in lieu of complaining. There's a lot to complain about. I agree, I agree, but you're not gonna get anywhere just complaining. Think outside the box and start a conversation. So that's this first piece of advice from our surgeon friend. And then he says, second one, and here remember he's talking about the field of medicine, but I think this applies equally well to education. Ask an unscripted question. Unscripted question, not something that's been prepared for you by somebody else. But he says, ours is a job of talking to strangers. Now that he's talking as a doctor, but to a large extent, ours also is a job of talking to just people who are initially strangers, but then become less so as we get to know them. But he says, why not learn something from them? If you ask a question, the machine begins to feel less like a machine. And this comes back to my point again about asking real questions as opposed to display questions. So again, thinking about the current situation, maybe you're teaching online, maybe you're using Zoom, maybe you're using, uh, and you're interacting regularly with learners, maybe on some kind of discussion group, but these are the kinds of questions that you might be thinking of asking. How you, your students, how are you adapting to online learning? What's good about it? Again, thinking positive. What's not so good about it? Hmm. Not perfect. Do you have a regular routine? That would be kind of fun. And that's good language practice. Uh, how much help do you get from parents, siblings, flatmates, etc.? What do you miss most about on-site classes? You know, students always used to complain about having to go to school, university, and how boring it was. And uh, But now they really miss it, a lot of them. Uh, some of them don't. Some of them don't. What's the app or tool that you like best? Why? What could your teacher do to make it easier? Now that's a challenging question, it's a high risk question, but it's one that I think would really help inform teachers. You know, sometimes just, these are the questions that are worth asking. What would you really like me to do? What is it that would make learning easier, whether online or on site? And finally, do you use English when you're not studying it? You know, when you're not doing your online classes, do you listen to music, do you watch movies? Uh, what do you learn from that, for example? Uh, and how often? So these are kinds of unscripted questions that um, the doc, our good friend, the doctor might, might ask if he were a teacher. Okay, his third piece of advice, count something. Count something. And this is about research. And we haven't talked about this. Uh, I, in my list of uh, professional develop, development activities at the beginning, I had, um, action research is one and I haven't done it really very much. Uh, so I haven't, I'm not qualified to talk about it, but that's really what this is all about is counting something. Regardless of what one ultimately does, one should be a scientist in this world. We're all scientists, really. We're all in the business of experimenting, looking at results and looking for evidence. He says, in the simplest terms, this means that one should count something. If you count something you find interesting, you will learn something. Now, what does he mean? What, what could this mean? Well, I mean, one of the things as a teacher educator that I get my students to do when they're doing their teaching practice is to look at their habits, some of their routines and habits that they may not be aware of. And this is the beauty of having videos of their own teaching. I remember once I was at a conference in New Zealand giving a plenary talk. And after the plenary, a woman came up to me who'd been in the audience and she showed me, she had a kind of like, and she had checked off like 
about 92 times she had counted something. I said, what's that? She said, that's the number of times in the talk you made this gesture. Can you see it? You pulled on your nose. I said, 92 times in a one hour talk? You must be joking. She said, no, 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 I counted them. So this is something I did without realizing it, a mannerism that was obviously for her uh, distracting. And we don't want to have distracting mannerisms in the classroom because there's other things that we want the students to focus on, not the number of times you did this. So, of course, I immediately stopped doing that. Another conference, more productively, I was at in Turkey, where somebody did something similar, but she showed me on a map, and you can do this in the classroom with, student, with your trainee teachers too, where I directed my attention during the course of the plenary. And it was very clear that I looked in that direction much less often than I looked in that direction. I looked to the left much less often than I looked to the right or to the center. Now, why? I don't know. But this is not good if your attention is being directed at only one part of the class. So she counted the number of times I looked over here and the number of times I looked over there and the number of times I, that's really, really, it's kind of uh, threatening, but it's, it's useful. I wanted to say to the woman about the nose, did you, did you start counting like right from the first moment? These are some of the things you could count if you're teaching online or, 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 or in a classroom for that matter. How many times did I interact with this student, that student, the other student? Yeah, how many times did I use their names, et cetera, this kind of thing? How much did I speak compared to the students? You know, what percentage? You can go back, look at the recording if there is one. How many real questions did I ask? Yeah, real questions like, what's your favorite fruit as opposed to how many fingers have I got? Uh, how often do I correct a learner's utterance? This is a value-free question. I'm not saying correction is good necessary, but it's kind of interesting to know how many utterances do we ignore? How many errors do we ignore? And what about these habits, these times that we say, particularly in, in live classrooms, when we say good, every time a student says something, good, good, good. I, I was sick last week, good. I broke my leg, good. I got food poisoning, good. Okay, all right, et cetera. These are the kinds of things we do instinctively, but it's not, it doesn't give a very useful feedback message. And then looking at the time that you spend, how much time do I spend online, for example, on procedural issues? What's the proportion of classroom time if there's an hour class i'm doing online how much of the time is spent resolving technical problems or doing social stuff like chatting how are you are you, are you well are you coping blah 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 uh, and how much time spent actually teaching and studies that have, have done that have been done on on-site classes on live classes show that a lot of time is spent doing management stuff uh, and uh, at the expense of actual teaching of of uh, uh, you know these things in, encroach into the lesson. How much time do the students spend on task? You know, how much time do the students also, what was their proportion of time? How much time do they actually spend doing something as opposed to getting set up, getting the technology working, asking questions about it, etc. His fourth piece of advice for professional development uh, and how not to feel a, a cog in the machine, how not to how to gain a degree of, of agency is to write something. Write something. So count something and then write something and maybe write about what you counted. Writing lets you step back and think through a problem. Writing gives you distance. Yeah. Most of all, by offering your reflections to an audience, even a small one, you make yourself part of a larger world. Now, remember when I said at the beginning, my, in my own biography, I started writing books uh, about teaching, but I didn't start them before I started training. I was training and then I started writing and it was the training that fed into the writing, but the writing also fed into the training because when you write something down, you need to be sort of committed to it rather than simply speaking it. And if there's an audience particularly, then it becomes uh, a different order of activity than simply chatting with friends uh, in the teacher's room. So um, writing things, we have uh, lots of opportunities now, more than we used to, to write because of online media. And again, I go back to my friend Sandy in, in Poland. Uh, she keeps a blog and she writes her blog reg regularly. And this is where I learned about Mentimeter. Remember that activity at the beginning? It's thanks to Sandy 
and her blog. And then she's also got lots of tips here about training, Zoom training, uh, as has Leo Sullivan, who keeps a regular blog. And here he's got some ideas for synchronous online lessons on Zoom. So these are things that people practicing teachers are generous enough to share with the community of teachers globally, writing blogs. And there's other things you can do writing wise, but this is one that's immediately available. And you've got an audience out there who's very, very keen to hear what you've got to say about issues like how to use Zoom, how to use Mentimeter. And finally, this is his last piece of advice, change. And this comes back to the reflective circle, the, the experimental part of it, change, do something different. Look for the opportunity to change. I'm not saying you should embrace every new trend that comes along, but be willing to recognize the inadequacies in what you do and to seek out solutions. Now, nothing's perfect. So experiment, try it again. What was it that Samuel Beckett said? Uh, try, fail again, fail again more successfully. I can't remember, but, but that's, and so here's, I'm just going to finish now by giving uh, an example of somebody, a teacher that uh, I know uh, who works uh, here in Spain, who did exactly this. He looked for an opportunity to change uh, and it involved writing and to a certain extent counting. Now this teacher is named Adam. Uh, he was interested in the idea of teaching without materials, um, the dogma style teaching and so, or teaching unplugged. So he started an experiment. And what's nice about this is he got the permission of his uh, director of studies in this private language school that he taught in, in, uh, in Spain, in the Basque country. He got her permission to do this experiment with a group of students and to uh, monitor it over one semester, one uh, school term and he called it Project Unplugged and he started a, a blog to write about it about what he was doing in the classroom to try to use to teach without using textbooks uh, and to get not just his own reflections on this process but the reflections of the learners and you can see that along the menu bar there, there is a learner diary. So he had the learners keeping diaries in English. So that's good language practice uh, about reflecting on their experience of these classes. And he also has a link there to the lessons that he actually taught. Uh, and uh, what was really, really nice about this was that not only did he write about it, but he was able to speak about it at a conference. This is the IATEFL conference in Manchester, I think a few years ago, where there's Adam on the left and very nicely, his director of studies came to the conference too, to show support. So this is a teacher, he'd been teaching for one year and he took this initiative, not only to do this experiment, but to open, to, to blog about it, but also to present about it at an international teachers conference. And that's a big leap. Talk about, you know, a steep learning curve. And this is some of the, these are, this is one of his reflections on the class. He talked about a class. This is his reflection. He said, so the class was half full as I entered. He said, I didn't say anything. I simply picked up the interactive whiteboard pen and handed it to the nearest student. I smiled and gestured to the board. I sat down and began filling out the register, making sure not to look as though I was going to assist in any way. Yeah? There were a lot of strange looks, shoulder shrugging and general confusion. Yeah? The students, what was the teacher doing? Why is he not talking to him? The first student wrote, hello, on the board. It was a start. So you see what he's doing. He's trying to kind of move the agency in the lesson from the teacher to the learners by abdicating his traditional role of starting the lesson, talking to the learners, writing on the board, et cetera. So he sits down, he write, marks the register and he gives a pen to the student. The student eventually, after a little bit of embarrassment and confusion, writes, hello. Now the learner, uh, one of the learners reports the same lesson uh, in his diary and says, today has been a different class. The teacher didn't speak at first and we had to start the class. That class was interesting because Adam did that we think how start a conversation. It was a good class because we spoke about our lives. Oh, yeah, yeah, why not? It's a language class and language is about people. 
so so um this is just an example of somebody who took the initiative to change something in their classroom to change the syllabus to use a learner generated syllabus if you like not to use the textbook syllabus and to change the actual shape of individual lessons so that it wasn't teacher driven all the time so let's just sum up um atul gawande again says in his conclusion so find something new to try like adam did something to change count how often you succeed and how often you fail write about it ask people what they think ask these unscripted questions see if you can keep the conversation going that's what continuous professional development is all about now i've got uh uh five minutes left i just want to i haven't talked about the future and the whole title of this talk is uh the future i just want to say that nobody we've never been less uh in a position to talk about the future of anything actually at the moment we don't know about the future of education uh i don't know what kind of institution you're teaching in but those of you i teach in the university and i've just been told that we're not going to be running uh, a course next semester in the in the northern european fall that is to say i'm out of a job i'm not the only one who's out of a job uh of course but or temporarily hopefully but uh we don't know what's going to happen and uh we but we have to uh gird our loins as it were to think about what we could be doing to um help position ourselves as individuals so that when we if we do go back to classrooms etc that we are an, uh able to do that or if we have to continue teaching online forever and ever uh that we can do this successfully so when i took the future of professional development is the future of education it's the future of the world at the moment who knows but these are some of the things that i think are factors that we will need to consider first of all again the traditional one training versus development at the moment there's a lot of training going on training teachers have never used uh online apps and tools before how to do them training people how to use zoom how to use the breakout rooms in zoom for how to find the chat bloody box uh this is what this is incredibly important so don't knock training people need training at the moment perhaps more training than development but training is short term and in the long term we also need to develop as teachers by not just relying on these tools but thinking of ways of using them creatively and maybe thinking selecting from all these tools that people are suggesting we should use and saying well actually I don't like that one I don't see what it does that is actually better than what this one does or this one's too complicated or my learners don't like it etc um being proactive versus reactive at the moment we're being reactive i think a lot of teaching online is about being re reacting to the situation what one writer called emergency remote teaching emergency remote teaching it's not online teaching it's emergency remote teaching we're teaching as if we were in the classroom but we're doing it online because there's an emergency but eventually we may need to think about online teaching and think about what's the difference what are what's why is online teaching different from classroom teaching and what is good about it and what can be made better about it um so that would be being more proactive is it theory driven the professional development or is it practice driven now a lot of professional development has been and it is in universities etc it's kind of theory driven read about the learning cycle now read about this read about the other and reading we've established is good but if it's not grounded in classroom practice if it's not written by practicing teacher trainers or teachers then it's going to be at a considerable distance from the reality that we find ourselves in so i think any form of professional development in the future needs to be essentially practice driven practice driven informed by theory but practice driven top down versus bottom up by that mean i means that is your institution institution controlling the professional development or is it something that's generated and run by the teachers themselves and of course again the best professional development is probably that which is bottom up that is driven and motivated by the teachers about and and is directed uh is self-directed and self-assessed 
Uh, is it formal versus it by formal? I mean, like university courses, professional diplomas, et cetera, or informal is something that we do um, as part of our professional existence. And both forms of professional development obviously have their validity. Um, but just because you've done a formal course, an MA or whatever, doesn't mean to say that you stop thinking about your teaching. Uh, and very importantly, is it individual collaborative? And again, all the research suggests that the best professional development is that done with your colleagues, with your peers, maybe with the supervision of your supervisors, et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, it's not impossible to work individually. And of course, we're all working individually to a la large extent because we don't have access, face-to-face -face access with our colleagues necessarily. So uh, it is, it, it's, a, it's a good time to explore ways of developing individually. And of course, things like reading, attending webinars, etc., cetera, are ways of doing that. And very importantly, is it one-off? Is it just like one session? Is this the only webinar you're ever going to watch? Or is it sustained? And what happens after the webinar? How, is the com how do we keep the conversation going? You know, that's very important. All the research that's been done on professional development shows that unless the development initi initiatives are sustained over the long term, people revert back to what they were always doing. And finally, of course, the big question now, is it on-site or remote? Uh, can you have professional development which is off-site uh, which is online, which is remote. I'm involved in a project at the moment, uh, just to, to end with, which I'm very excited about, where I'm working, I'm consulting on a project, which is to train uh, a number of teachers who are not professional teachers in uh, Jordan and are refugees to teach other refugees English online. Now the training is done online and the teaching is done online. How do we do it? It's done through WhatsApp. So there's a WhatsApp group and they exchange uh, links to sites and things. Uh, and that's the main channel of communication. And then there's regular Zoom training sessions, uh, as well as Google Docs. They post lesson plans and things on Google Docs. And they watch YouTube videos that have been selected for them of classrooms or of online teaching or whatever, one-to-one -one teaching, et cetera. So those are the very minimal, all free technologies, free. Yeah? WhatsApp, Zoom, Google Docs, and what was the other one? YouTube. Yeah? And they're teachers who have got no previous teaching experience. Uh, and they're working with trainers who are based in the UK. And it's fantastic. It's as good as it gets. It's a wonderful experience and it's all free. Nobody's paying for it. Nobody's being paid to do it. The software is free. And eventually they'll be training fellow refugees English and those courses, classes will also be free. So this is the, this is the future of professional development. It seems to me the good future. Okay. I'm going to finish that. I've drawn heavily uh, for many ideas from this book, co-written by a colleague of mine, Gabriel Diaz Maggioli, the vice president of IATEPL at the moment. Uh, very good book available or booklet, 24 pages, very readable and practical, available online, free, uh, at that website at the bottom, Cambridge Papers and ELT. And Silvana Richardson, again, uh, co-wrote that. You may have heard of Silvana, um, uh, uh, a very charismatic speaker. And finally, I have to mention, because I was uh, I edited this book, uh, many of you may have heard of Jack Richards, a co-patriot of mine from New Zealand, written many course books and many scholarly books. And he wrote this book, uh, 50 tips for teacher development, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. Of course, I declare an interest uh, because I edited it, and it's for the series that I edit for Cambridge University Press. But it's like, oh, you could put this book on your backpack and you could go around the world, and it's got so many good ideas, 50 ideas for developing as a teacher. And on that note, there's my website. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing now, and hopefully I can get back to the question and answers. 
And uh, Raja, Dr. Raja, do you want to say anything at this point? Yes, yes, Mr. Professor. Maybe less time for the question and answer. Shall we take only two questions? Yes. Okay. And probably those who are in the Zoom session, probably you can post uh, your question in chat session because we will not be able to uh, enable your mic because it will become a complete chaos. So, so that let me read the question to uh, Professor Scott and he will uh, answer the two questions and we'll wind up the session. Yeah, actually, the first question, what are the challenges you have faced during your professional development? And how to handle those challenges? <laughs> You've got another hour. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I tell you, I've learned lots of challenges. I tell you one challenge that I personally faced, and I think is the, in, as you become more detached from the classroom, this is a, logistic problem in some ways, uh, you lose, you're in danger of losing credibility. When you stop teaching and you start telling people how to teach, then where is your credibility? Mm. So uh, one way of maintaining credibility is to keep teaching if you can. The other, another way is to at least visit classrooms and watch other people teaching. And I've learned, actually most of what I've learned about teaching, I've learned by watching other people teach. Um, and the third way is, of course, uh, talking to practicing teachers as much as possible, not talking to them, listening to them. So when I go around the world, or when I used to go around the world, uh, visit at conferences, etc., uh, this was a great opportunity for me to keep in touch with practicing teachers and find out what it is that concern them and find out what uh, their local concerns are and also find out how similar they often are to teachers in other parts of the world. So that, but I mean, it's not the same as actually teaching. That was one reason also I went back to the, the classroom, became a student again, because again, at least that gave me an insight into what happens in real classrooms. But I think if you're a teacher educator uh, uh, at whatever level, then you do need to remember that your credibility to a large extent depends on your ability to identify with practicing teachers. And you don't want to lose, you don't want that gap to widen irretrievably between classroom practice and then talking about classroom practice. Okay, the one more question. Do you prefer practical experience or the theoretical experience for the professional development? That, that will be the I last think, question because we yeah, have many, but we don't have time. I think um, coming back to that, polarity between theory driven and practice driven. I mean, one of the, uh, I started my teaching career uh, with a short four week course that I did at International House London in, you know, before most of you were born. Uh, and it was extraordinarily practical. It had a teaching practice element, two hours a day of teaching real students from day one. So it was really deep end experience. We were plunged in. It was very uh, high stress, uh, but it was very positive stress in a sense, because we were supported all the way <laughs> by our colleagues, by our instructors, and also by the students who were lovely. Uh, and that for me was one of the most formative learning experiences of my life. I'd been to university, I'd been through school and everything, but learning how to teach in that very short concentrated, I mean, uh, session really impacted upon me. I wasn't a great teacher when I came out of it, but I had the tools to at least get through my first year or two of teaching before I went back to do a diploma course and then subsequently a master's. Um, but I, I cannot overemphasize the importance of the practical. If there's a training course which doesn't have a practical component, then it's not a training course. It's a, it's a theory course. So, you know, it has to have some kind of classroom. Of course, it's hard to organize, particularly now if you're training online. Um, that's another one of the challenges that we're faced with. Uh, I could take another question, Dr. Rajas, yeah. if, if you have one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, let, 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 me, let me check. Uh, uh, from Philippines, uh, a person is asking right now in Philippines, 
face to face interaction is not allowed then most students don't have the technology to participate in online teaching and these students are mostly the slow learners what will be your suggestion to handle this for a situation yeah i mean uh, we this is where we're in such a steep learning curve at the moment because dealing i mean as i said before with these group of uh teachers who are being trained up in jordan they have very little technology but they do have phones um okay. and i think that's the kind of bottom line phones are not i not the best medium for uh a lot of activities but they are pretty good uh particularly smartphones and if you can watch youtube videos on phones and if you can communicate ideally with other students on phones then uh that's a start and if you can communicate with the teacher so i mean i'm not an expert here this is where i'm really outside my comfort zone we all are but as i said before if you go online there's 101 blogs blog sites that have opened up recently which are giving exactly this kind of advice from people who are doing this so as i said i recommend sandy millen's blog site i russell stanard who's a colleague of mine who i trained on a diploma course has a lot of excellent youtube videos on how to use zoom and other things but also how to talk around the problem of of learners not having access to these kinds of technologies it's a huge problem uh but it's not 100 miles different from the students who used to not have access to books uh and then students who didn't have access to classroom so we've always had students have had been deprived of access to education uh and it's not a good thing but there are innovative ways where inspired teachers have managed to deal with these uh, very difficult situations not by complaining but by taking the what small initiatives they can do in these contexts and then talking to other interested colleagues about them doing what they can but i have no easy answers to a very very difficult question yeah. professor uh, scott thank you very much it's a great pleasure and honor to, uh, to having listened to you i guess it's my great uh, pleasure to having introduced to many people all 1050 people watched live online right from the beginning to till now So it, it says so how people are crazy about it because even I didn't expect I got 2,500 registration for this thing and uh, I think as of now in the Zoom around 150 only limited and the uh, YouTube around uh, 1,050 and uh, we got registration from 75 countries. Professor Scott, it's wow. thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor because even I never expected such a huge response. Then only I requested you to. Then we were really worried about what to do. Then we made a decision to do a, do a live in the YouTube, and it, it really worked very well. Thank you very much, Professor, and it is my great honor because I I still remember the day when I met you in the IHSL, and it's my second opportunity to host you. And you are such a lovely person. You know, you are always my mentor. Thank you very well, much. Well, how, how we can Thank I hope we can meet again, Doctor Rajasekhar. I hope we can meet again. Thank you very much, everybody. Have sure. a good day or evening, and uh, do the best that you can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Dear participant, thanks. Thanks for uh, your uh, participation. It's my great honor. And uh, on behalf of VIT, Valur Institute of Technology, VIT University, Chennai campus, I thank all the uh, participants for your patient listening. And I think I thank all those across the world. Seventy-one country participant participated, and it's a really a truly international webinar. And it has all happened only because of the speaker, Professor Scott Sandbury. Let me thank him from my bottom of the heart, and uh, I thank all the uh, attendees for your patient listening. And I, I guess definitely this will be a change maker in your life. Your de development will definitely will become a huge change. Will you will be able to create because of this webinar? Thank you very much, uh, and I'll, I'll meet you in some other webinars in the future. Thank you. Bye bye.